Well, good evening, friends, and uh, a very warm welcome to everybody on this very warm Sunday evening. It's been rather an exciting afternoon, hasn't it? I thought most of you would have been glued to the set as we were at home. It was very exciting. So well done, Andy Murray. Didn't the boy do well? Terrific. <laughs> Scottish? Is that... Scottish, thank you very much. Well done, Scotland, England, Ireland and Wales, but especially Scotland, especially Scotland. It was terrific. Now, we were all very, very proud of him, very proud. Now, friends, the tennis comes and goes, doesn't it? It's there and it's gone, done and dusted, but the gospel goes on forever. Isn't that wonderful? So we can forget that and we, we turn to the Lord and we've come here to listen to his words to be thankful to him for the great glorious gospel, which confounds all the accusations and falsehoods of the enemy. And we're here also to encourage each other and uh, to love each other and support each other as we serve the Lord as Christians. Let me start by reading some verses which Paul Brennan, who's our preacher tonight, is going to take up and, and, and bring to us later. Jude, verse 3. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation... I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ." Well, battling words, and we'll hear more of that a little bit later. But let's turn now to our hymn book, and we'll open up at number 95. Number 95, which is a version of Psalm 95. Come with all joy to sing to God, our saving rock, the living Lord. In glad thanksgiving, seek his face with songs of victory and grace.
let us bow our heads together. And I'll lead in prayer, but let's join our hearts together as we come to God, as we bow down before him, as we acknowledge that he is the great king. As we've just sung, come near to worship, come with faith, bow down to God who gives us breath. God is our shepherd, God alone. We are his people, all his own. It gives us such joy, our dear Father, to acknowledge again that you are our shepherd, you and no one else, and we are your people, we are your own, we belong to you. And we belong to you, dear Father, at such great price. We remember that we're yours by creation. You made us. You put the very breath into our beings. You brought us to life. You opened our eyes and ears so that we could look around and begin to notice uh, the creation and our own place in it. But above all, we remember the price that had to be paid for our redemption. We think of our Lord Jesus coming down from heaven, such a long way down to earth, not simply to share our life as a human being, but much more than that, dear Father, to give his life so that we should be spared and saved. We have not deserved this, dear Father, but we know how much it is an expression of your eternal and undying love for us, that you were prepared and the Lord Jesus was prepared to go through this terrible thing for our sake. And we think of his blood shed upon the cross, the blood of the Lamb, the sacrificial Lamb, And we thank you that he was prepared to allow men to nail him to the tree, to raise him up, to drop that dreadful pole into the ground and to hang there for our sake. So we thank you, dear Father. We cannot thank you enough. And we pray that you will write, that you will etch ever more deeply into our hearts a sense of gratitude to you and to the Lord Jesus for what you have done for us. We pray that you will indeed never let us forget what has happened on our account for our sake. And we pray that our lives as your people will reflect our joy and our thankfulness more and more. Help us especially, dear Father, always to be unashamed of the gospel, unashamed of the cross, unashamed of your words recorded in the Bible, the teaching of the gospel and the teaching of the Christian life and how it is to be lived. So, dear Father, as we gather here tonight seeking to listen to you and to encourage each other, we do pray that you will lift us up. We pray especially for any hearts here tonight who are bowed down because of sorrows and troubles. And we ask you to encourage them and to help them to see afresh the greatness and glory of your love for them and the gospel. So open our ears, we pray. Help us to listen. Help us to respond with joy. And all these things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, not much to say by way of um, notices, except that drinks of a hot and cold type will be served downstairs in room six as usual so do stay for that afterwards if you possibly can it's a good chance to go up to somebody you've never met before and shake their hands and say who are you and I'm so and so it helps to knit us together so do let's uh, enjoy that opportunity I should say as well that we will be celebrating the communion service directly after our our main service is over Uh, I'll be leading that from downstairs but we'll just continue straight into that uh, as soon as we've sung the final hymn up here And we look forward to welcoming Paul Brennan to give us the first of three, three Sunday evenings on the Epistle of Jude. More about that in just a moment. So let's sing together again. Our next hymn is number 894. 894. Come, O fount of every blessing. 894.
Well, a very good evening to you all. If you could please turn in your Bibles to the letter of Jude, which is the penultimate book in the New Testament. It's tucked away there just before Revelation, and it's on page 1027, 1027 in the Church Bibles. As Edward mentioned, we'll be spending the next uh, three Sunday evenings together in this short and very punchy letter. Um, So we'll read the whole letter this evening, so let's pay attention. Jude. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels, who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when when the archangel Michael contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses. He did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them. For they walked in the way of Cain, and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error, and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are blemishes on your love feasts, as they feast with you without fear, looking after themselves. Waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, Wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord come with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud mouth boasters showing favoritism to gain advantage. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, build yourselves up in your most holy faith, pray in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. 
and have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. It certainly packs a punch. The offering will now be uplifted, so do spend a few moments as the music plays to have a look over this short letter. The offering will now be uplifted. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the gifts that you graciously give to us. All that we have is from you. And these small offerings that we bring tonight, these offerings we give for your work, might they be used for the work of your gospel here in Glasgow, week by week as we seek to proclaim Christ, in whom we have eternal life. So Father, might these gifts, small as they are, be used for your glory and your purposes. And as we think tonight about the gospel, about contending for the one true gospel, we pray for gospel churches across this city, across Scotland, across the UK. Might they hold without budging to that one true fixed gospel. Might you raise up godly men who will teach your word faithfully. Men who, whose lives bear witness to your grace, bear witness to the gospel. And we pray for churches full of Christians who live and speak for you. Father, we dare not take these things for granted, and we ask and urgently pray that we might see a new generation of gospel churches across this city and across the UK. And Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the Bible. And as we come to it in a few moments to hear from it. We know that it tests each human thought. It pierces us right to the bone. You see all of us. 
So help us as we sit under your word, as we all sit under your word, that we would hear and that we would do your will. So help us tonight for your glory, for your name. And we pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Good. Well, please do turn in your, your hymn books there to hymn number 548. And we'll sing this before we come to think about these verses in Jude. Do please have Jude open in front of you as we spend a few moments looking at these opening verses. So why study this rather short, out-of-the-way sort of letter? It just takes up one page in our Bibles. Do we really need to spend the next three weeks on it, you might be thinking? Just 25 verses. Well, you can count yourselves lucky. Willie spent about nine weeks on this way back in 2006. (laughs) So if I successfully whet your appetites, do have a listen to those online. But why study it? It's a letter that packs a punch. And it's a letter that is as relevant today as it was back in 2006 when Willie preached on it, and two millennia ago when Jude first put pen to paper. It's a letter dealing with ultimate realities about salvation and judgment, about holding to the true gospel or being deceived and swept along by a false one. We need to sense the urgency of this letter and heed it heed the warning. We need to be persuaded to contend for the gospel and yet be reassured by Jude's confidence in the sovereignty of God. We're going to take the letter in three steps. Tonight we're looking at the first bit, verses 1 to 4, and then next week we'll cover the big chunk in the middle of the letter before we look uh, in our last week together at verse 20 to the end. So tonight, we're in the first four verses. Now, before we jump into the letter, I want to introduce you to Jude, the man who wrote the letter. Who is he? Well, look with me at verse 1. Jude, 
a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Now, there's a bit of a surprise here. He's the brother of James, nothing surprising there. But there are only two mentions of a James Jude brother combination mentioned in the whole Bible. And we can be pretty sure that the James mentioned here is the leader of the church in Jerusalem, the writer of the letter, James, which we know well. And he was very well known in the early Christian world. In fact, James and Jude were sons of Mary and Joseph, which makes Jude the half-brother of Jesus. So why doesn't Jude introduce himself in that way then? Why not say, I'm the brother of Jesus? Instead, he describes himself as a servant of Jesus. Now, yes, that's a sign of true humility, and it indicates that he doesn't regard himself as privileged. Although a half-brother of Jesus, he doesn't get special status. But it also reveals that Jude is a man who sees things as they really are. He is not primarily Jesus' half-brother, but rather his servant. And this seeing things as they really are is characteristic of the letter as a whole. Jude sees reality. He puts the ultimate realities, the ultimate destinations for the Christian and the ungodly people, as Jude calls them. He puts those ultimate ultimate realities very clearly. And it makes for rather an uncomfortable read, doesn't it? As we read it earlier. So that is who Jude is, a man who sees reality. So let's now turn and look a bit more closely at these verses 1 to 4. And there are three key points to make, three key things to see. Firstly, Jude's plea. Secondly, Jude's reason. But also Jude's reassurance. So we'll look first at Jude's plea. And his plea is clear. Christians must contend for the gospel. Christians must contend for the gospel. Jude sets out his reason for writing very clearly at the start of his letter. He gets right to it. There in verse 3, we read about the letter he wanted to write and the letter he had no choice but to write. Look with me at verse 3. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation... I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. See, Jude wanted to write about their common salvation in general terms. That was the letter he wanted to write. He wanted to address them about the future and certain salvation that awaited them on the great day of judgment. Salvation is a forward-looking word looking forward to that day when they can be sure as they stand before Christ that they are saved. And it was a salvation that they shared. The people Jude was writing to were beloved, dear Christian people who he cared for deeply. They share the common salvation. And Jude wanted nothing more than to write about that. But he had to write a more focused letter because of the real urgency and danger presented to that common salvation by these people who are in the church. Did you notice how again and again in the letter, Jude calls the threat these people? There in verse 8, yes, in like manner, these people. Verse 10, these people. Again in verse 12, these Verse 14, it was about these. Verse 19, it is these. Jude had to write because these people who are in the church present a threat. He had no choice in the subject matter of his letter. His subject, his main point is an appeal, a plea to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Contend. Do we feel the force of that word contend? Contend. The word is steeped in the imagery of the Greek games. 
We need to imagine athletes competing, contending for a medal. They're striving, agonizing, straining, sweating, giving all to win the prize. Jude is not calling these beloved Christians to passivity. Quite the opposite. He's calling them to agonize, to strive for the faith that they share. Think back just under a year to the glorious London 2012 Olympic Games. Think in your mind's eye of Jessica Ennis on her 800 meters final event. She's got the gold medal in the bag pretty much, and yet she strove for that victory. She went for it. She contended. Or just think a couple of hours ago to center courts at Wimbledon. Contending. It's an image of the Greek games striving. So they're, they're to contend. But what are they to contend for? What are they to contend for? Is Jude vague and imprecise in what he's telling them to contend for? No, not at all. He's very specific. He's objective. He says that they are to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. It's the gospel. Jude isn't talking about our little area of church responsibility, the flower arranging or bell ringing. He's not calling us to contend for those things. It's the gospel. It's the objective, final gospel that's to be contended for. It's a gospel that's been delivered, past tense. It's done. It can't be changed. Think of your Royal Mail recorded delivery that you receive, and you've got to sign for it. It's been delivered. It's been signed for. It can be proved. It's objective. It can't be changed. The gospel has been delivered. It's a done deal. The gospel message that Jude is writing about here is objective and final. Contend for that. But where do we find the once for all delivered to the saints faith that Jude is talking about? Well, it's right here in our Bibles. It's not to be added to or subtracted from. It was a danger his readers faced 2,000 years ago. And it's a danger we still face today. We can think of countless examples, can't we, of people who want to remove the bits of the Bible that are embarrassing or uncomfortable. Jude is having none of that. The gospel is fixed and it is final. Contend for that, says Jude. But let's be realistic. Contending in the sense that Jude means it here is going to be deeply unpopular for his original readers and for us now. As we all contend for the gospel, the gospel finally revealed in the Bible, we will be faced by opposition within the church. People like those here that Jude talks about to hold to a different gospel. And we know something of that, don't we, in the past year or so. We will all face opposition and ridicule from within the church as we all contend. And it's all of us that are to contend. This wrestling to preserve the gospel is not restricted to a few professionals. It's not directed to the pastor primarily or the elders or a select few. No. Who is Jude addressing here? The saints. Look down with me at verse 1 to see who Jude is writing to. To those who are called, beloved, kept. He's writing to all of those who call on the name of the Lord as Savior and King. And that is all of us who are Christians. It is not to be left to Willie Philip or Edward Lobb or Bob File or Andy Gemmell. It's not to be left down to the elders here at the Tron Church or the staff team. It is directed to all who call Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior. We are all to hold to, to fight for, to contend for the true, complete gospel. It's all of us. We all have this, this responsibility. And that is a real challenge, isn't it? Think about the things that we 
contend for in day-to-day life. For me, I have to confess, it's table tennis, making sure I beat Josh Johnson. (laughs) We need to put that same desire to contend, to fight for the gospel, that same energy, that same desire. Now, Jude is here addressing our minds and our hearts. Are we prepared to contend? We'll think about our hands in a couple of weeks, what we're to do, how we are to contend. We'll look at that when we consider the last few verses of, the gospel, of this letter. We're going to think about the how question in a few weeks, but before we get there, Jude answers the why question. Why contend? And we come to the second point, Jude's reason. And Jude's reason is that the true gospel is under threat. We're to contend because the true gospel is under threat. Jude wrote, urging his readers to contend for the faith because people with influence in the church were peddling a false Christianity through not so much what they said, but how they lived. Look with me down at verse 4 where Jude gives his reason. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. The gospel itself was under threat, but not because of some external force. It wasn't the threat of an antagonistic culture. It was not the threat of an authoritarian regime. It was a threat from within. The problem is not with unbelievers outside the church, but rather with gospel underminers within. And this has always been one of the greatest threats to the church, hasn't it? The danger of ungodly people within. It doesn't take outside opposition or persecution to destroy the church, that usually has quite the opposite effect. Persecution often leads to spread and growth of the gospel. But we need to look a little closer to home and to the church itself. That was where the danger lurked for the recipients of Jude's letter. It's the great danger of people who say the right thing with their lips, but whose lives tell a very different story. These ungodly people, as Jude calls them, people who exert some influence in our churches, represent the most likely source of a real threat to the future of the church. These people are bringing a different gospel. So let's see why these people are just so dangerous and why Jude has written specifically urging them to contend for the gospel. So three things to note about these people. These ungodly people are firstly unnoticed. They're unnoticed. We see that there in verse 4. This is why Jude is writing. These people did not come in with signs saying, watch out, we're holding to a different gospel, so beware. Not at all. They seeped in. They infiltrated without anyone noticing Isn't that just a little scary? Isn't that why these people are just so dangerous? They've smuggled in a false gospel. A gospel, as we'll see in a moment, that has its focus on living for the now without reference to eternal judgment to come. A gospel that denies the lordship of Jesus over all of life. Now, these people who Jude was writing to, they weren't ignorant. They weren't untaught Christians. They were real, intelligent Christians. But these ungodly people were then, and they are now, convincing enough to threaten and fool real, intelligent Christians. They slipped in, they were unnoticed. They were normal looking. 
So let's not fall into the trap of thinking that this is some danger out there. We need to be alert and ready. These guys missed it. Don't assume we won't miss it. They should have been ready. They should have been alert to this new brand of Christianity that these people were peddling. They've been exposed to the apostolic gospel. But they weren't alert. They weren't ready. Hence Jude's urgent letter urging them to contend for the gospel. He's urging them to wake up to the reality that's in front of their eyes, but they can't see. So these ungodly people were unnoticed. Second thing to note, these ungodly people are destined for condemnation. These ungodly people are destined for condemnation. There in verse 4. Jude explains that their judgment has been predicted. These people were long ago designated for this condemnation. What is Jude talking about? What's he referring to? Where exactly were such people designated for condemnation? Well, Jude has in mind here the ancient Jewish prophecies found in Scripture. He goes on in verses 5 to 19 to prove from the Old Testament that these people, these false teachers, through their teaching and practice, are in a class of people who incur God's wrath and condemnation. As Don Carson puts it, these scriptures that Jude refers to demonstrate that the judgment that befell certain people in ancient times points to similar judgment falling on those with similar failing in Jude's own day. These people really ought to have been familiar with predictions about such people and the terrible, sobering reality of their condemnation. It really ought to have been obvious, but they missed it. Let's heed that warning and be alert to Jude's warning here that there will always be opposition to the biblical gospel within churches. Let's not ever think we've somehow made it and become immune to such a threat. Heed the warning. Jude is unmasking these people for who they really are. And the reality is that they really are marked out for condemnation. It's as stark as that. Jude urges his readers, and he urges us, to see the danger sign. Don't you get caught up with these ungodly people, says Jude. Look where they're headed. Eternal matters are decided in the here and now. What could be more urgent or pressing than that? That's why you need to contend, because these people are headed for eternal condemnation. So these ungodly people are unnoticed. They're destined for condemnation. And thirdly, they're living by a different gospel. They're living by a different gospel. It's now that we get to the real center of the matter, the source of the problem that Jude saw, but which these beloved Christians he's writing to missed. These ungodly people pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ, says Jude. Remember that these ungodly people are embedded in the church. Their threat is not obvious. But Jude doesn't tiptoe around the subject. He's not treading on eggshells. He calls them ungodly. He says that they are perverting the grace of God and denying the Lord Jesus. What exactly is going on? Well, the behavior of these people has descended into sensuality. And the word sensuality, as Jude uses it here, has particular emphasis on sexual immorality. These people have slipped into that, and they're using the gospel of grace as justification for it. They're denying the lordship of Jesus over all of life. Two central elements of the gospel are being eroded here, the grace of God and the lordship of Jesus. The grace of God Remember, it's God's grace that teaches us to say no to ungodliness. It doesn't teach us to say yes to it. And the Lordship of Jesus, remember that as Christians, 
We are called by God to live under the Lordship of Christ, and that means obedience. We were bought with a price. We're not our own. We're to obey, to live under the Lordship of Christ. Why didn't the church recognize this? Why didn't they see it? The false gospel being brought in subtly was seductive and attractive. It wasn't, as one writer put it, theoretical atheism that was the problem, but rather practical ungodliness. These ungodly people weren't blatantly teaching false doctrine, but were rather seeking to loosen the moral commands placed upon Christians in favor of a sensuality And they were doing it through how they lived. It was their lives. These people were lips, not lives Christians. Our friend Dick Lucas put it this way. Although these people no doubt mouthed Christian phrases, quoted the Bible and knew all the songs, they were not to be taken at face value. Jude was denouncing their friends and heroes as anti-Christian pagans. They said all the right things, I'm sure, but beneath the surface, they lived sensual lives. It's so very easy to play the part, say the right things, but no one knows about the sensuality going on behind closed doors. The pornography, the affair, whatever it might be. No one can see what's really going on, What was really going on here was a denial of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. These people used the words of faith, but disobeyed the commands of faith. They used the words of faith, but disobeyed them. And isn't that what's been going on in the Western church in recent years? And it's so dangerous because our default is the easy life, isn't it? The avoidance of difficulty. That's why the ungodly message of sensuality is just so alluring then and now. False teachers are not going to call us to something more difficult. Something that means less enjoyment now. It's easier to go the way of sensual living and to convince others it's the right thing to do. It's to be more relevant and in step with the world. It's easier to go with the flow and live for pleasure now. It's much harder to heed Jude's plea and contend, contend for the gospel that demands obedience. Do you see what's happened? These pretend Christians have dimmed the lights on ultimate future reality. Their lives, speaking of living now in terms of what is pleasing now, that's what these false teachers, these ungodly people are up to. They've dimmed down the lights on future reality. Jude's antidote is to turn up the lights on ultimate future reality. Here is where these false teachers are really headed, says Jude. Ultimate condemnation. And here's where those who contend for the gospel are headed. They are headed for salvation. So live now, not in the light of now, what feels good now, but in, re- in the light of reality, in light of the future. Contend now because the now is not all there is. If we don't contend for the gospel, once for all delivered to the saints, if we don't contend for that now, then the gospel that gets handed down to our children, our nephews, our nieces, our children's children will be a false one. A gospel that leads not to future salvation, but future condemnation. Jude is as stark as that. It's as important as that. So we can see, can't we, why Jude was just so eager to write, urging these beloved Christians to contend for the gospel. The true gospel was under threat. Will we heed Jude's call to contend for the gospel? Will you contend? That is our responsibility. And whilst we must take that seriously, we do need to remember another truth that Jude repeats 
in this letter again and again. And our third point tonight is Jude's reassurance. Jude's reassurance. And it's this, that God will keep you. God will keep you. This letter, although calling us to the serious task of contending for the gospel, also gives great assurances of safekeeping for the Christian. We're to contend in the knowledge that those who hold to the apostolic gospel, the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints, are kept by none other than God himself. Did you notice that word or variations of it that top and tail this letter? Look down with me at verse 1. Jude writes to those, verse 1, who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. Look a little later to the end of the letter, uh, in verse 24, with the great doxology. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Yes, we are to contend for the gospel. We have a responsibility to do that. But we do so safe in the knowledge that we are kept. Kept in a future sense. Jude, as we've said in this letter, is looking forward to that great day of judgment when Christ returns. Jude's horizon in this letter is the ultimate horizon. For those who are in Christ, who are kept, they can be sure of salvation from judgment. Friends, if you are in Christ, you can be sure of salvation on that great day. And that is in stark contrast, stark contrast to the false teachers who are destined on that day for condemnation. God will keep you. We know that is true ultimately, don't we? We know that those who are in Christ Jesus are certain of salvation, certain of eternal life with our Heavenly Father. Remember that the biblical faith is a faith fixed on the future. Biblical faith is a faith fixed on the future. We look forward to a certain salvation then. But living now, with struggle now, we must contend in the now. That has and always will be the life of faith for the Christian. It's not always easy in the now. But we have, Jude assures us, the sure knowledge that we are kept by our God and Father through the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And we will find salvation on that great day. Be assured brothers and sisters, that we are called, loved, and kept. But don't miss Jude's urgent appeal. As one writer concluded, Jude knows that the divine action in calling, loving, and keeping safe must be met by faithful human response. And the response called for here is to contend for the one true faith. The stakes could not be higher in Jude's day or in ours. Do we see the danger? Ungodly people within the church will always threaten the gospel by repackaging it and making it more appealing in the now. Be alert to that. It's worth reiterating a point of application made this morning. These people were unnoticed. They were unnoticed, and often when the gospel is under threat, the situation on the ground is rarely clear. These ungodly people, these false teachers, are not easy to spot. They're normal people. They look like just like everyone else. These people in Jews' day look, looked good. They were convincing. They spoke the language of the now, enjoyment now and it's the same today let's be alert to that how are we to keep ourselves from this danger the answer here is to contend for the once for all delivered to the saints faith will you strive for will you agonize for the gospel 
Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word to us. Lord, your word is often so direct, so sharp, but at the same time so reassuring. Lord, would we heed this warning here in Jude to contend for the gospel? But would we do it in the sure knowledge that we are kept and that we look forward with certainty to salvation? Lord, help us to get our minds around this. May our hearts be moved to contend for the one true gospel. Help us, Lord, in this coming week for your name and your glory. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to sing of that gospel now as we stand together to sing in Christ alone. Following straight on from singing this together, Edward will be leading the communion from the downstairs, so his face will appear on the screens after we've sung this together. So let's stand and sing in Christ alone.
Well, having sung that lovely hymn together, we now prepare our hearts to receive the bread and wine, the tokens of our Lord Jesus' suffering. And we invite to receive the bread and wine all those who are repentant and trusting in the Lord Jesus for their forgiveness. So this is a sacrament for Christian believers, and it's given to us by our Lord Jesus to strengthen our faith and to strengthen and deepen our sense of gratitude to him for all that he was willing to go through for us. However, as we approach the table and prepare to take uh, these tokens of his suffering, our hearts may sometimes be fearful and our conscience may be tender. So let's listen to the words of comfort and assurance that the Lord Jesus and his apostles give us from the Bible. Jesus himself says this, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The word whoever there is a great word. Whoever believes in him, from whatever background, from whatever experiences, whoever believes in him shall not perish. That's the promise of the gospel, but have eternal life. And listen to the words of the Apostle Paul. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. In other words, he came for people like us. Hear the words of the Apostle John. If anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, and he is the propitiation for our sins. So let us pray, having listened to those words of encouragement from the New Testament. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, in your tender mercy, you have given us your only Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, so that he should suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. And we remember this evening and remember with glad hearts how on the cross he made there by his once-for-all offering of himself a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the world and in his holy gospel, he instituted and commands us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. So hear us, merciful Father, we humbly pray, and grant that we who receive this bread and wine, according to your Son, Jesus Christ's holy institution, and in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body, and blood. The night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And having given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many. Often as you drink it, remembrance of me. Amen. So I'll now invite our elders to come forward to receive the bread and wine and to bring it round. And our custom here at the Tron is that when you have a piece of bread in your hand, do eat it immediately with a thankful heart. But when you receive a small cup, just retain it, retain it in your hand until we all have our cups together. And then I shall say some words which indicate that the time has come for us to drink that together. So let us receive the tokens of our Lord Jesus' suffering with joy and thankfulness.
the Apostle Peter writes these words, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. So let us with grateful hearts drink together. Now let us bow our heads and we'll pray. Almighty, ever-living God, we thank you for the reassurance at this communion service that your favor and goodness are directed towards us, that we are truly members of the body of your Son, and that being members of his body, we are also heirs through hope of your eternal kingdom. We humbly beg you, Heavenly Father, to keep us as faithful members of your church and to strengthen us by your Spirit that we may fulfill those good works which you have prepared for us to do. And we ask it through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We sing together hymn number 900. 900. Now to him, our is able. So may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. <laughs>